Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to Train the Trainer webinar with GWIZ Education. This is a live webinar. Uh, it is being recorded, so if for some reason, if you have to leave before it's over with or you would like to come back and review, we are going to record and you can use the same registration link that uh, you signed up for the webinar to come review the recording at a later date and or share that link with a uh, co-worker uh, if you think that it would be of interest to them. Um, we're going to try to be very respectful of your time because we really appreciate you taking time out in the middle of the day to learn a little bit more about G with. We have some uh, folks that are familiar and some folks that are not familiar with GWIZ education. Um, but with that said, Beth Smith's going to do the training this afternoon and I'm going to turn it directly over to her and let her get started. Um, but just before we do I turn it over. Up in the top right hand corner of your screen, you'll see your control panel. Um, if you have a question during the webinar, if you can click on the little hand, the question, and then type or type your question down there at the bottom, we will get that if we can uh, read it or share it with the group. If at all possible, I will respond directly back to you in private or if we need to talk about it as a group, I'll read it out and we can talk, um, address that question uh, as a group so everyone can hear. Please take time to download that handout. That is our catalog, which is also on our website, www.gwizeducation.com. So you can download that if you don't get it during the webinar today. Day. Um, but again, I'm going to turn it over to Beth. And um, if you got a question, type it in the box and we'll get going. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Beth Smith. I'm one of the partners with GWIZ Education. And I'm very pleased that you've all taken time to join us today. We are, as Sherry said, recording this. So if you have other members of your team that could not be on the webinar live, you're welcome to share the registration link for this webinar with them. And that will allow them to listen to the recording. We will also post this on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, which is GWIS Education for FCC, and that way you can view it there as well. Um, a little bit about GWIS before we get started and really delve into things. GWIS was founded in 2012. We felt there was a need for something for family child care that was dedicated to them, and so we created this curriculum that we produce and supply via our website uh, just for family child care. Uh, we do have a lot of people keep asking us, why are you going to do a center version? And we haven't gotten that far yet. But GWIZ was really created to support providers. And, and on top of that, we recently, as of July, started a cohort that is an online cohort that providers can join. And we're going to be doing a monthly webinar reviewing the upcoming units in the curriculum. And then there will also be a special focus during that cohort webinar. So for instance, in July, we reviewed the August curriculum materials, and then we talked about language development, what it is and how it's integrated into the curriculum. In our uh, next one, which will be August the 20th in the evening at 7 p.m., we are going to be talking about our September units and also diversity, because one of the units we're doing for September is called My Home, Your Home. So it's the perfect opportunity to talk about diversity and how important it is to integrate diversity not just into that unit but into all the units that we do based on the makeup of their group. So today what we're going to do is I'm going to go over because we do have a mix of people who are aware of GWIZ and who we are what we do and we have those of you who are new to who we are and what we do is we're going to touch on some of the important components that are on our website. We're going to look at the lesson plans and talk about how GWIZ addresses all 10 developmental areas for all the different ages. And we're also going to explore how GWIZ supports the learning environment. We know that family child care providers in many states are being evaluated using both class or FICRs, and we can address how we help providers in the, particularly with class, the instructional area, but also in then areas of modeling language and interactions with children. That's a big part of what we do. Um, we are not a box of materials that is shipped to a provider's house. Everything we do lives on our website, which we know has put us ahead of the curve in many ways. Technology has been something that has been a challenge for some providers, but as 
the world evolves, everybody seems to be getting more in tune with it. And it also allowed us to provide this curriculum and quality curriculum for family child care providers that did not cost an arm and a leg. And so that was really important to us and that's why we chose to go with this model. So our website, as Sherry mentioned, is is this is, is just gwiseducation.com. And we have tabs at the top, and under each tab, there are a lot of different materials. I will highlight this tab just quickly. Everything under here is free to everyone and open to everyone. There are a lot of different tools that you can share with providers, and you're welcome to do so. Uh, in fact, I am not signed in yet to actually get to the curriculum that is currently available to our subscribers. I will do that shortly. So everything you're seeing and everything I'm going to touch right now, you can access without being a GWiz customer. So right now, one of the most important components of GWiz is our user's guide. And this is our training manual. I do a training on the introduction of GWiz where we go through here in depth and we go over all the different parts and pieces to help providers understand the philosophy behind the curriculum, what the 10 developmental areas are, what does it mean when I talk about literacy, how do you know when an activity in GWiz addresses literacy, etc. So right now I just want to go in here so you can see what this looks like. And again, everything we do, or most everything we do, are PDF files. So as long as a user has Acrobat Reader, they should be able to open all of the files without a problem. And then they can choose, and we talk about this when we do training with providers, whether they want to just save it to their computer or if they want to save it and they want to print it. And we talk about how do you do that? Okay, how do you download this? How do you save it? And then how do you print it? Of course, it's going to look different. I'm on a PC right now. It looks a little different on a Mac. And we talk about that as well. And again, the technology can be a stumbling block for some people, but we walk them through how do you access the curriculum materials? How do you download? How do you save? And we actually have a step-by-step -step document with screenshots that helps with that too. Um, so let's just look at the table of contents really quickly here and I'm not going to spend nearly as much time going through this document as I would if I was working with a group of providers going through here but I just want to highlight what's in here um, the first section is about the role of the provider and it talks in that section about our new GWIS cohort what that is how it works and the training associated with it I should note that training webinar training with the cohort is free it does not cost anything you do not need to be a customer to attend anyone can attend and those trainings. This section talks about individualization and authentic assessment. The GWIS curriculum, and this comes up right away, so I'm going to bring it up right away, is assessment. We know, and because we are approved in many states for QRIS, we know that most providers in those states and others as well must use a formal assessment tool, such as Teaching Strategies Gold, Ages and Stages, the Elm Scale, there's a lot of different ones. So when we created GWIS, instead of, quote, un reinventing the wheel, we looked at those assessments and we looked at what we're doing and because we're covering all 10 developmental areas for all ages, providers can truly choose whatever assessment tool they want to go along with GWIS. They're not locked into a specific one and we did that intentionally because we know that some of those assessment tools are easier for providers to implement than others. We also know that given your experience as a provider, you may choose to use one over the other based on which works best for you. Um, for instance, we have a provider who's been with us a long time in the state of Ohio who's a five-star provider in their Step Up to Quality program, and she uses Teaching Strategies Gold with GWIS, and she finds it works really well. There are other providers that use other curricula, I mean, other assessment tools and find they work well too. And so before that comes up, I want to just address the way we look at that, but we all we do have components that help providers gather anecdotal notes, do reflections upon those anecdotal notes, plan activities based on those anecdotal notes, which then can go into a portfolio. We also have something called an individualization web, which is a tool that providers can use to individualize the curriculum units that we provide, but also to address special needs. Maybe you have a child that's working on a developmental skill like fine motor control, and you can use it for that. And I'll show you what those tools are in just a second. 
Then section three goes through the 10 developmental areas that GWIZ addresses. We address all 10 developmental areas. We have a picture code for each area of development that then we use in the lesson plan so providers can connect those dots. They'll know when they look at an activity in our lesson plans exactly what developmental areas it addresses. And then in the back of the lesson plans, we take that a step further and go to the specific skills that each activity addresses. The philosophy, research, and more is in section four. The philosophers upon whom which the curriculum is based, the research studies upon which the curriculum is based. We do a lot of reading in terms of what's coming out of places like the McCormick Center based on family child care particularly and what approaches work, what approaches don't work, how we can better support providers, hence why we started the cohort. Um, and so all that is there, I'll show you that. And then section five is just getting providers started with, okay, what is a teacher's guide? What do I do with it? What are the story props? What do I do with it? And it works them through all the different components. So that said, we're just going to speed through some of this because I want to just show you what's in here. Um, again, top reasons why providers like us is we're convenient and economical. You can access materials 24-7. You can subscribe 24-7. Everything is online, so the provider actually chooses what they want to print and what they want to just view on their computer or their tablet. For instance, this document. You wouldn't need to print this if you didn't want to. You could store it on your computer. You could access it on your tablet from our website. It's really up to you how you use it. Um, it prepares them for school and life because we're covering all those different developmental areas. We are aligned and approved, and it, we're aligned to state standards all over the place, but we're approved for QRIS in, in several states, um, Florida, Illinois, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, there's a whole slew of them, and you can find that information on our website. It's easy to use. That was really important. We wanted us to write a curriculum that a provider could pick up and not need days and days and days of training that's very expensive, that they could pick it up and they could run with it. And yet, it's not very structured. It's open-ended. The children have choices. They can easily add in their own experiences. When I do training with providers, I explain it like it's building a house, right? So we're providing the foundation of the house and you're going to build it. You're going to make it look how you want it to look. You're going to build the kitchen how you want the kitchen to look. And so we're just giving them that starting point. And the biggie, the most important thing is it includes activities for infants all the way through school age. We look at the lesson plans, I'll show you how we do that and how we even within those activities level it even further and give adaptations for different developmental levels. This is just a couple of testimonials. And then we go into the section I was mentioning about the role, which talks about things like modeling language, questioning, teachable moments. And we'll look at that in the lesson plans because it's easier for me to show you there. But this section explains exactly all those things. Teachable moments. We actually have a video about teachable moments. Um, here's about the GWIS cohort. This is, again, it's just started in July. The idea is that the research is showing that providers that feel a part of a community and feel supported are much more effective and much happier because it can be a very isolating job when you're all by yourself and you only have little people to talk to all day, some of which probably don't talk back yet. And so the cohort is a way for us to support providers by providing training on the curriculum, but also on early childhood concepts, like I just said about language and diversity. Eventually, we're going to do one on anecdotal notes. So you can learn more about the cohort on our website, but this is just why we started it. Um, because we feel like it's our way of supporting providers. This is again the section on individualization and authentic ass assessment, and it talks about what anecdotal notes are, how providers can individualize GWIS by following this approach where they observe, they reflect, they plan, they do, and then they reflect back again. And then this explains all those different steps. And again, I'm not going to, I'm going through this very quickly with you. And when I was doing this with providers, we'd spend a lot more time. This sheet work, page walks them through what an anecdotal note is, why it's important, and how to write anecdotal notes. It's very challenging to learn how to do that well. Even for someone who's had a lot of education, it can be really hard to keep your opinion out of there and what you think is going on. And so when I do this with providers, I talk about how it's just as if you were a video camera and you're simply recording what you're seeing and what you're hearing, not what you think what you're seeing and what you're hearing. 
and then reflections that's your time to say okay I just observed this now what does that tell me and then what do I do with that information and this talks about how you use our two components the observe and reflect grid and the individualization web to do just that so in this guide we actually have a blank copy of the observe and reflect grid and they are welcome to print this page out as many times as they want to do their observations and the reflections and then that leads into well here's a sample one so they kind of know what it should look like and then here's a individualization web that's also blank we provide one of these in the curriculum that's tailored to each unit so it would have the unit title and the topics so they wouldn't have to fill that part out but this is a blank one so let's say they're doing their own unit they can print this out and use this for each child to again you can individualize based on interest you can use it to individualize based on um, a, an area of not necessarily a disability but even just an area where the child is working to build skill and then we go into our developmental areas and indicators this is the last section I'm going to hit on in this um, but I wanted to show what our areas are um, when we created GWIS we looked at state standards across the United States as well as the Head Start ones which are the new child outcomes or it has a big long title I can't remember but anyway those and so the 10 developmental areas that we focus on in GWIS were the ones that came up most frequently across the board so language development physical development and health literacy math science social and emotional social studies and then down here we have creative arts logic and reasoning and approaches to learning each one of these is going to have a picture symbol associated with it and each area also has very specific skills which we call learning indicators that have codes that go with them so for instance under um, logic and reasoning we have two specific areas of skill LR1 and LR2 you can find those in this guide what they correlate with and then we also utilize those when we do the chart in the back of the teaching guide that shows you specifically for each activity what skills you're addressing so I'm going to actually go out of here because I don't want to spend too much time again to get to the user's guide you simply go under our products and to the user's guide um, right now I want to go back home and before I move on to any to the next piece I want to show you do the, does anyone have any questions about anything I covered in the user's guide again I went really fast through that and when I do it with the providers it's usually at least an hour that we spend going through just that guide um, but I wanted to show you where it was and what's in there just so you'd be aware but I do want to pause just briefly to see if there are any questions if so just type them in the question box and Sherry will read them out If you don't have a question right now and you decide in well when you get started again please don't hesitate we'll get to it because um, sometimes after you think about it a little bit you'll come up with your question but we don't have any now Beth so okay I think perfect we keep going all right so under our products again and, it, and remember this is open to everybody I'm going to go over here to this section called the learning environment um, we have a provider in New York City who's very uh, she's really on the ball and she asked us to create this document to help providers learn more about their role within the learning environment and so this booklet goes through exactly that it's similar to our users guide but not nearly as long and it talks about the providers role in setting up the learning environment and their role in that environment and so this is a booklet you're welcome to use with providers because a lot of this applies regardless of what curriculum they're using we use an acronym called SMILE and we say that SMILE is for self materials interactions learning and engagement and the next page is break that down so for instance just with their self that you know they need to be positive they need to think before they speak um, they should remember that nonverbal communication is a way that particularly your nonverbal children talk to you that they need to take care of themselves and get rest and eat healthy and be enthusiastic and if they're enthusiastic then the children will be enthusiastic the materials um, we actually have a component that helps it's called add and enhance it gives them a list of, act of materials they can add to different learning areas to help enhance the unit that we're doing but this is an overall view of things that they can put in the different areas within their program and we also know that providers have limited space because they're in their homes so these are things you could put in a plastic tub and you could put them out of the way when you're not using them and then you could get them back out again 
This section talks about interactions with children, how important it is for them to talk, talk, talk. I don't know how many times in the lesson plans I write, particularly in my infant experiences, that it's so important to talk to children and to describe what they're doing, describe the materials they're using, describe cause and effect. Okay, you pushed the car and the car rolled. Why did that happen? Oh, look, it has wheels. Just to engage in those conversations, to be proactive and not reactive is really important as well, to listen and listen and listen. And this also applies to parents and caregivers too. Um, after all, they do know their child better than anybody else. And that learning takes place every day in all different situations. It's not just when the activities that you're planning on doing, it is also in times like transitions and meal times and hand washing, diapering, toothbrushing, toileting. I mean, if they think about how much time they spend doing all of those things in the course of a day and that they can be learning times as well as routine times, it's a very powerful thing. And then how engaged. Engagement is super important. This number one is really a big deal in today's world to put down the cell phone. I have to tell my kids this all the time. Put down the cell phone, be present. And so, Part of that is maybe going back and reviewing their policies when they have a handbook for new parents of how they handle cell phones, that perhaps they only answer text messages at a certain time in the day or emails at a certain time in the day, unless, of course, it's an emergency, and then if it's an emergency, you need to call um, because it's too easy for you and a parent or a caregiver to get into a texting back and forth about how are they doing? Are they having a good day? Da, 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 da. And you're in the middle of, as you know, when you're a provider, they're in the middle of working with a lot of other children. So putting down that cell phone is a big deal. Asking open questions. We write this into the GWIS curriculum. I'll show you it in the lesson plans how we do this. Keeping learning styles in mind, that the children all don't learn the same way. Some children are more auditory, some are more kinesthetic. What does that mean and how do you incorporate that into the activities? And then letting the children lead. You know, taking what we've given and it's gonna spur new ideas and letting the children run with those new ideas. That's a really big deal. Um, and so this, this guide or this booklet is available to everybody. It's not something that's behind a locked door that you can't get to. We encourage providers to have this as just like the user's guide and to refer back to it from time to time. It's really important as you look at being evaluated with the environmental rating scales to know what your role is in that learning environment. And if you want to see, here's the add-in enhance. These, again, is a document that we include with each one of the units that we do that gives them ideas of things they could gather to put in the learning centers to enhance the environment even more to align with the units that we're studying. Okay, does anybody have any questions about those components relating to the environment? Um, nothing going on right now, Beth. So I think we okay. can keep going. The right. reason I'm sharing it with Beth is she can't see if you type in your question. So I have to share it with her. Yeah, I have to keep my box closed or I can't see my screens, then I can't navigate. So um, that's exactly why she's letting me know if there are any <laughs> questions. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna sign in as if I was a customer. Everybody has a username and a password, and if they can't remember their username, um, their email works for that. And again, we have a document that shows them exactly how to do that. Let's hope I typed it the right way. Or I'll get an error that says, I'm sorry, you can't get in. Now, mine's going to look a little different because I'm set up as what we call a trainer, which means I'm not a customer customer. Um, so this screen down here looks a little different. But what I'm going to do is this new tab has magically appeared that says GWE customers. So I'm going to go over to this month's units. And currently we have our August units up, which are fair time fun, back to school, and our July units, camping is cool, and super science. And the way this works is we're in what we call right now our crossover time. Starting in July, we are now posting both of our units for the upcoming month on July, the uh, on or around the 20th. We used to post one and then a few days later post the other, but now we're posting them both at the same time to give providers more time. And so that's why right now we have both our July and our August units are, are currently available to our customers. We posted our July units on or about 
June the 20th, and they will stay up through around August the 5th, and then we will take them away. And the reason we do that is because if we kept all the units that we have done over the years on our website available to customers, first of all, our website would crash because the files are huge with all the art that's included in them. And second of all, it would just be way too much. So we post them. We tell providers, look, we post them on, it's on our calendar. We let them know usually very via Facebook. Sometimes we even send an email and say, hey, the new units are posted. Be sure you download them and save them to your computer. We also encourage them to back them up to, you know, uh, even a stick drive, a flash drive, an external hard drive. I use the cloud, Google Cloud, because I have a Gmail account. It's free. It's a great way to store it so I don't lose it in case something happens to my computer. But that being said, let's say you're a customer of ours. Your computer goes completely gonker and you lose your files for whatever reason if you're an active customer and it's the current month and you say oh my gosh I lost all the files it's not a big deal because once you get back in and you log in you can just download them all over again they're still there um, so we know those kind of things happen you'll notice that we do have two buttons here I'm gonna look at the super science unit um, English and Spanish are currently we have all of our family components available in Spanish that includes our family letters our digital family notes are all about me we have been working to try to find a solution for converting our teaching guides over into Spanish but as you see when we go into them they are very extensive files and they're not written in Word so it's not a matter of clicking a button it's done in something called Publisher, which is like a page making program, and there's a lot of art, which means that each individual section has to be translated individually. And we still are trying to figure out a workable solution for that because we know there are a lot of providers out there that Spanish is their primary language, and we know there are people out there that would love to have the teaching guides in Spanish. Um, I do have a cohort of people in LA, um, actually in Alameda, and there is a there is a uh, quality specialist out there who brings her Spanish-speaking cohort together once a month um, after we've posted the new units. They get together and they go through them in Spanish, but you know it's written in English, but they go through it in Spanish and talk about it. And they actually go through the activities and they engage, and she said it's been working very well. So for those of you who are seeking a solution for Spanish, we're still working on it, but that might be a workable solution. I am sure that if she, if I asked her, she would be more than happy to connect with others who might be interested in doing the way she's doing it. Um, but again, she's in California. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to download, go to the download for English files. And once I do that, I'm going to see a description of the unit. And then I'm also going to see all these different components. So teaching guide, teacher tool, materials list, provider review, et cetera, et cetera. Right now I'm going to go into the teacher's guide. There's a teacher's guide for each unit that we do. So in GWIZ, there are two units each month, each month, each unit has 10 days of experiences plus school age activities. So really there's a total of 20 days over the course of a month. And we give them a lot to do so that it can definitely be expanded out for, day, for months that might have more than 20 days. Plus we want them to incorporate their own ideas. Um, we don't want us to be an end all be all. Uh, we want us to be, as I said before, the foundation or the starting point. So what I'm going to do now is go down here and just talk about how the lessons are structured. We have an introduction. Anything they need a little bit of extra time is right here, which is also on our materials list, by the way. This is our table of contents. And then I'm going to pause right here. So remember I said there are 10 developmental areas that are covered in the GWIS curriculum. Well, these are our program symbols. And this is in every teaching guide. So if a provider forgets what, for instance, the world means, they can go here and they know, oh, that's a social studies. Or if they see the smiley face, oh, that means it addresses approaches to learning. So this is the 10, 10 areas. Actually, creative arts has two because we use this for music and this for other creative arts. We have get moving, which means that it's a gross motor experience. We have the sunshine, which means it can or should be done outside. And then this symbol is character education. We build character education into the curriculum. We cover responsibility, respect, honesty, and kindness. Those are the four areas that we build in. And so when they see this symbol in the lesson plans, they know they're addressing character education. 
The next page is an overall grid that shows all the different experiences that are planned in the lesson plans. Some providers will print this one page and post it so that parents can see what's coming up for the next 10 days. The school age experiences are down here. And then we get into the lesson plans, and this is where I'm going to slow down, and if you have questions, type them in the question box, because after I go through this day one, I'll stop and see if anybody has any questions. So in this box up here, we have the unit name, the focus, and then this is a cumulative list. So if the provider did all the experiences we had planned today, they would cover language development, approaches to learning, creative arts, social studies, social and emotional, logic and reasoning, physical development and health, music, and science, okay? We always have this box right here. We have a health and safety tip every day. We have a teaching tip every day. This one has to do with character education. And we have a transition idea every day. And this transition idea is a way to help the provider move the children mentally and physically from activity to activity throughout the day. In this box, the blue box, we have our vocabulary and then we have ways that the provider can model language. And I say when I'm doing provider training, this is not vocabulary we're going to put on index cards and memorize or something. These are words we want you to incorporate into your conversations with children. And sometimes they're like, really? Predict? Experiment? Those are big words. Mm -mm. The more you use words like that in context with children, the more meaningful they will be and the more likely then they will to understand what those words mean and then when they are more verbal, if they're nonverbal, they will begin to use them and, and use them the correct way. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's why we have those words there. Then we go into what's called our exploring together. Exploring together used to be what we what we used to call circle time. And then we decided that it really wasn't circle time. It was more of a time for children to explore with providers. So this one has to be about meeting Serena. We have a puppet friend in each of the second units of the month and this one happens to be Serena and she's a scientist because we're just beginning to explore what, it, what science means. So we're going to talk about scientists. And these questions are the questions that we provide, again, to help engage children in meaningful back and forth conversations, some of which do not have a right or wrong answer. Um, in fact, a lot of them. Why is science so important? How do scientists use their sense? If you were a scientist, what would you want to explore? These are open-ended questions. And yes, they're going to have children who are nonverbal, but that's okay. Their nonverbal children are going to learn from those that are more verbal as they listen to these back and forth conversations. And then we use technology in a meaningful way in GWIS. We will build in links to videos. This one happens to be about different types of scientists that are meant for children. And when I'm talking video, I'm talking three minutes or less. Um, very short videos. I use a lot of Nat Geo videos. I use Discovery Kid videos. Um, very short informational things that, again, you're probably not going to go to a lab and see a biologist or a chemist at work, but you can watch a video and see what they do and talk about what you see in there. Um, what kind of equipment are they using? What are they doing? Why do you think they're wearing gloves? all those kind of things. So whenever it's appropriate, I will build those links in as an option that they can show them to the children if they feel like it would help them build background information about what a scientist is, what a scientist does, or if they don't feel like they need that, then they wouldn't need to use it. The second page are our small group experiences. These are for toddlers through four-year-olds. And then at the bottom, I'll scroll down in a second, and, and we have one for infants. Um, as you will see, we level these based on developmental areas, or excuse me, developmental levels. And I talk a lot about that when I do training with providers. I'll say, okay, what I want you to do is if you're going to set up an experimentation station, you're going to read this experience and think about the children you have in your group, each one of them. And you're going to think, okay, which would be the best way for me to set this up for Jose or Amanda or Charlie? Okay, and so then she can decide based on the ideas we give her, plus her own, how she wants to set this up or how she wants to adapt it to different developmental areas. Now, some of our experience, like this one, Mix and Paint, where the children are actually painting with mixing paint, they're being scientists as they mix salt and flour with paint and see what happens. Um, it doesn't need to be leveled because 
automatically a child that's a toddler is going to take it in a whole different direction than a child that's maybe four. We do always include, if there's not leveling going on, something for the more advanced students so you can really push them and the provider can push them to think and ask those open-ended questions, which again, if I scroll up, you're going to see we have open-ended questions for the experimentation station here and for that one down there. And then I scroll down a little further and we have the infant experience. And this one's called mix it up. And basically all they're gonna do is mix cornmeal and flour or water. And obviously the provider's gonna need to be there right with them to make sure they don't eat it. But it's a wonderful sensory experience. It's something you might wanna take outside because it could get messy. Does this mean that nobody else but infants are gonna do this experience? No, you, I guarantee you would have toddlers and twos and threes and even fours that would be interested in doing this experience together. And that's great if they wanna do that because then the older ones can engage in conversations and the, and the baby can listen and learn too. So we always have an infant experience every day that's designed to be done one-on-one -on -one with the provider, but that doesn't mean that other children can't join in as well. And I forgot to mention, I'm going to scroll up just a bit, you'll see with each one of these experiences, again, those picture codes. So if I do mix and paint, I know that I'm going to address language, approaches to learning, creative arts, social and emotional, logic and reasoning, science, and physical development and health. And again, when I show you the back of the teaching guide, there's a chart that will then show me specifically what skills mix and paint addresses within those areas. All right, as I promised, I'm gonna pause for just a second to see if anyone has any questions regarding how a daily lesson plan is laid out and how we address different areas, I mean, different ages within that lesson plan. I know Beth said this is the next 10 days. I think you, uh, one thing to note, I'm not sure she mentioned it, is this is not written to a calendar. So even though this is the July program, it could be picked up and used at any time. Um, so we address holidays and um, special days under our home tab on the home page, and that's just open to anyone. Um, don't have any questions yet, Beth, but so we can keep going. But again, please, if you do have a question as we proceed, just don't hesitate to type, type it in. Thank you. Okay. All right. That was a good point, Sherry. Yeah, we don't date anything. So again, when I scroll down to the next day, it just says day two. It doesn't say July the 21st or July the 22nd because truly once a provider downloads this, let's say that they're, they're having – they're going on vacation or maybe they have a lot of children on vacation right now and they don't want to use this unit right now. There's nothing that says you can't do this later. Um, it's not like it's dated or it's tied necessarily to any particular season. So the next day just goes just like the first day. Again, you have the exploring together experience and then you have your two um, hands-on child child experiences. Sometimes we'll do things here like this one, which is where they're going to make a um, a a volcano and watch the eruption because we're talking about chemistry in the sand table. Obviously, that's something you're going to want to be involved in. So it'll be a little more, not necessarily teacher directed, but let's just say teacher supervised. <laughs> um, and so it goes through all the days like this. Here's day three. This one we're talking about science related to cooking because really there is a lot of chemistry when you get into it with cooking. We will occasionally suggest cooking with the children if that is allowed in their area to be involved in cooking because it's a wonderful sensory experience. It's also a great way to explore things like measuring in a meaningful way. And then, call, you know, it also changes, physical changes. Like how does that batter for that muffin change when it goes into the oven? And your more verbal children can predict what they think is going to happen when it goes into the oven. Then we get into, in this unit, we're talking about physics and gravity. We do some art related to gravity. We try to do things that, again, are not going to require the provider to go to the store and buy a bunch of things. We try to use things they're going to have around the house, around the backyard, things that they can find that are not that challenging to go find. And anything they do need to find ahead of time is going to be in red. And I'm going to show you that on the materials list. All right, now I can grab this, and I'm going to show you the school age. So we go through 10 days just like this, and then we get to our school age experiences, which are right here. Um, so 
Because a lot of people have school age children, when we created GWIZ initially, we asked, you know, do you want school age activities? A majority said yes. So we have six experiences for school age children, most of which that can be done for more than one day. So in other words, you can start it in one day and finish it another day, or you can start it one day and do it one way and then do it a different way on another day. Um, this one, for instance, is testing for pH, which obviously you would want to find litmus strips for Amazon, where I buy everything. So again, this would be in red. They would know they need it. They could order it. That's not an expensive thing to order. We don't use things that are normally very expensive, and that is the anomaly rather than the norm where we have them buying something. Um, a baking powder experiment. We bake two types of shortcake, one without baking powder and one with. What do you think is going to happen? Um, does it slow down? Testing for friction on a ramp, like what happens when you put sandpaper on it? What happens when you put aluminum foil on it? What happens when you put carpet on it or a rug? The rock cycle, talking about how rocks are formed and how different rocks are formed. So again, these are things that, that the provider can do with their children who are older and ready to take things into a deeper level. We do have what we call make it sheets. Um, these are sheets that are totally optional. They are not written into the curriculum in any way, shape, or form. And normally they are designed to be something that the child will then utilize for dramatic play. In this case, they're going to use this racing car for an experiment. Um, they might be something open-ended like this, where you're they're going to actually deck they can actually collect rocks and put it in a cereal box and make their own rock collection. Um, we might have something that's like a lotto game that then they could take home and play with mom and dad or grandparents, whoever their caregivers are. It might be an I spy. We just did an I spy not too long ago, which was a scene, and the provider would print it out. They could send it home, and the parent could use it or a guardian could use it to play I spy. Great thing when you're waiting in the doctor's office. Um, and then these are for advanced preschoolers. These would be children who are getting ready to go to kindergarten who are more ready to explore writing, um, beginning sounds, literacy concepts such as um, how words have syllables, that type of thing, and also some more advanced math. In this case, they're exploring measurement and making predictions about how far a car is going to roll once it gets to the end of a ramp, and then they can graph that information. We might do addition, subtraction. We might even do division, like, okay, we have a, an apple, and we have four people. How are we going to divide that up evenly and start talking about quarters and that type of thing. Then here's the chart I was telling you about. So we saw mix and paint earlier. So these are the specific skills and learning indicators that we have in our user's guide that tell you exactly what, are, what specific skills mix and paint um, addresses. And you can go to our user's guide and read what LD3, LD4, AL1, CA3, what they line up with. These are the, the same learning indicators, the same codes that we put on our alignment charts for each state. So on our website, on our homepage, if you scroll down to the United States map, you'll find our alignment charts, and those alignment charts would use these specific skills. So we go through the 10 days here on this side of the chart, and then on the next page, we have our school age experiences and the skills that they address. They just didn't fit. We do provide a book list so that providers can go to the library and get books or dig through their own personal libraries. We include original songs and rhymes to tunes that they should know, like The Farmer in the Dell. And if we're going to be baking anything or making anything that's a cooking experience, we provide the recipe. Um, and I'll explain the teaching tool in a second. For instance, here's oatmeal muffins and more songs. And then in the back of the teaching guide, if we needed something that I thought would be helpful to providers, um, it will go there. So for instance, in the unit My Home, Your Home, we're doing in September, we provided a lot of people people figure, I'll just call them people, people. So all different ages, all different ethnicities that they can cut apart and tape to blocks. And then they can use them in the block center. They can use them in dramatic play. They can take them outside and use them in the sand. So if there's anything I can provide that would be helpful to the providers in that case, I'll put it in the back of the teaching guide. I know when we did the farm, we gave them a sheet that had 10 sheep 
and they glued the sheep or taped the sheep to plastic blocks and then they hid them around the room and the children found them and they counted how many were lost and then they used them in dramatic play or they used them with blocks and built corrals. I don't know what all we did, but anyway, the bottom line is anything that I can put in the back of the teaching guide that they could print and they could use that would be helpful, I will do that to save them some time. Again, some of our providers will just view this teaching guide on their computer or their tablet and never print it out. Other people will print it out. Regardless, they just download it and save it. That way they have it. All right, I'm going to get out of the teaching guide and see if anybody had any questions about that component right now. There was a lot there. We also have a sample on our homepage um, that is representative of this unit that you can also download and take a, a deeper look. No questions typed in though. Yeah, Beth. Okay. <laughs> that will get All right. The so in the first unit of the month, we always have story props and there's an original story and then there's props to go with it. And those props vary. There's something they print out, they might mount it and cut it, or it might be a scene. It, there, there's a lot of different things we do. But in the second unit, we have a teaching tool. And the teaching tool for this unit actually has to do with first, next, and last. And we're talking about sequencing. And again, this would be a tool that she would use with children who are ready to talk about sequencing. You know, for instance, here we have a little plant, then it grows into a bigger plant, then eventually it even has tomatoes on it. So the teaching guide would include activities for utilizing this teaching tool with the children. She could also, because we're digital, print out a second set and make it into a learning center that she could keep out at all times. And again, there'd be adaptations. Like obviously your infants and to or your toddlers and your twos are not ready to sequence yet, but they can talk about what's happening. I mean, they can listen as you talk about what's happening in the different pictures. Um, so anyway, this is a tool that gives, that she can use at, at different, we do lotto games, we do memory games, we do patterning a lot of patterning strips and cards for copying, extending, and creating patterns. Um, so that's the that's ideas of what the teaching tool might be. The materials list is a printable list, or again, view on the screen, for all the things they're going to need to do the experiences that we have planned. And we try to use things, again, they're going to have around the house, not things they have to go buy and anything they think we might need they might need a little extra time to prepare or gather or locate like for instance baking soda and vinegar just to make sure they have those things in their kitchen cabinet most people do but I occasionally run out of both so just to make sure they have them and then same thing goes on to the next page we have all the 10 days here and then the school age experiences are right here items to collect are in red here and things they want parents and guardians to bring in as a reminder are there and then if they're planning their own experiences they can add notes here okay so there's one of these with each unit as well the provider's review is something that's important for them to do at the end of the unit to review okay I just did this unit on science which activities or which experiences did my children like the most and why and if I did it again what would I do differently it's really important we stress to providers for them to step back at the end of a unit and think about okay how well did this go what did the children like which ones did we keep doing over and over again which activities did they just not like and that gives you a lot of insight not only into the the unit itself but also to the children and their interests so that's provided all also with each of the units. The add and enhance is the same thing we looked at earlier, but it's specific to this unit of science. And then this is our new component, letters and literacy. This component came about because providers were challenged with, uh, and whether right or wrong, that a lot of children who are preparing to go to kindergarten in too many states these days are screened on their knowledge of letters, letter names, even being able to read simple words, which is to me crazy. But nonetheless, um, there are some children who are ready for that. I had a child who my daughter at four was reading well, and she was fascinated with letters and, and what they were from the time she was little. And so you always have those children. There is a little link here to, to an excellent checklist that helps providers know if their children are ready to explore this. And so this guide is, again, not written in the lesson plans, but is something that 
a provider who has children who they feel are ready can engage children in more of an exploration of letters, but it's within the context of the activities that we already have planned. So for instance, here with icy art creations, the children who are ready are gonna write their names on very large letters on paper, and then they're gonna ice paint over that. So you're incorporating an exploration of letters, but in a meaningful kind of way. Sometimes, same thing here with Mud Pie Madness. So you can look at this, and again, this is something that's totally optional. It's something that a provider can choose to use with children she feels are ready to do that, but we are not doing worksheets. We're not tracing letters. We are doing things within the context of the activities we already have planned and helping provide, helping children make that connection. For instance, it'll say things like here, as a children play, print the word ramp on a sheet of paper and read it to them and help them understand, begin to make that connection that everything that you say can be written down in words and that words are made up of letters. So in a very meaningful way. And then there's one of those for each of the units as well. Um, the All About My Week, this is a component that's available in English and Spanish. It's designed to go home twice, once at the end of the first week, once at the end of the second week, and it's a way for the provider to communicate with parents and guardians about the things their child was really interested in, the things they really enjoyed, where they spent a lot of their time, what they're learning to do. Um, what they're working hard learning to do, like you might have a child who's learning really, trying really hard to learn how to use scissors properly, and things they're getting really good at. It's just a way for them to communicate. I encourage them once they complete this to put a copy, make a copy, and put it in their the child's portfolio before they send it home because it's like a running record. If you go back and look over the course of even a year, you're going to have, let's see, there's two of these, four a month, times six. They're going to have, goodness gracious, 48 of them over the course of a year. So that's a really interesting running record of a child's development if you go back and look at those. And that is available in Spanish. Um, the puppet was the Serena puppet, the scientist. Sometimes that is just a folded puppet where they put their hand in it. Sometimes it goes on a bag that you stuff. Sometimes it goes on a paper towel roll or a rolled piece of paper. We also have a family letter. This is also available in both English and Spanish. It has an introduction that tells the parents and guardians what the unit is about, what the topics are gonna be, and then things they can do at home in bath time, meal time, bedtime, and when riding in the car that tie in nicely with the unit. And then there's always some type of a song or a rhyme or something that they can do with their child as part of this letter. Again, available in both English and Spanish. The individualization web I showed you in the user's guide, but here's the one that's customized to the unit. This is the one for super science. So it has this already filled in for the provider. And again, they can print up to 12 copies of anything that is for a child. We are not a per child cost curriculum. You don't have to pay per child when you subscribe we're assuming that you're going to have up to 12 children because we know some of the larger family childcare homes have that many. And so they can print up to that many. Each unit also has two digital family notes. Digital family notes are set up like a photo on your phone. They're a JPEG file. So providers can save this to their computer. They can also save it to their phone, and it can either be emailed or texted to the parents and guardians available in English and Spanish. It's just a real simple thing that they can do with their child at home to reinforce the unit. Um, and this is the second one. It has to do with baking and chemistry. Um, and then our make it sheets, we saw those within the within the um, teaching guide. Again, they're optional. Again, they can print up to 12 copies. They can print just one. They might have one child who's getting ready to go to kindergarten who they think is ready to do whatever the experience is. And then for other ones, like an iSpy, they might say, hey, I can send this home with everybody because everybody can play iSpy. So really, again, it's up to the provider which ones they choose to pick and choose to print out based on the children in their group. Um, and that's the beauty of being digital. They can do that. It's not like they're locked into buying for six or 12 or 10 or five. They can really pick and choose and, you know, print out what they want. If they don't want to use it at all, that's their prerogative. Um, so that is the units um, that we have available. If I go back, it's just going to take me back to where I can see all the current units that are available. And like if I wanted to do download the camping unit, I would go here. If I need to get my August units, I would go there. Um, and again, this tab, GWE customers, showed up once I was logged in. If I log back out, that's going to disappear. And we do have some special tools that are just for customers. So we do some freebie things just for our customers as a way to say thank you, and we would post them underneath this tab.
Okay, so right now I'm going to stay logged in. I'm going to go back to home. And I'm going to just scroll down. Sherry was talking about the free sample. Um, everything that you would need to look at the free sample is under here. Uh, I think it's called Wonderful Nature. And it's a great unit to use any time of the year because it's about outside. Um, and all the different things that are outside. But all the components that the provider would need to use it are there. We really want providers to be bought into the curriculum and make sure that it's going to work for them. We know there are some out there that prefer a box of stuff to come to their door every month, but we also know that those cost well over $100 a month, and we're not anywhere near that price. Um, in fact, I always forget to talk about price. <laughs> so if you scroll down a little further, you'll see our video gallery. That's where this video will be posted, as well as our video from July for our first cohort is in there, um, where we talk about language development, and then here's our price. So we're $18.95 a month. $53.95 for a quarter or $192.95 for a year. And the reason we can be so economically priced is because we're not printing a bunch of things and shipping a bunch of things. Um, it's really up to the provider what they print, what they don't print. I ran some data recently, and we haven't posted it on the website, but I ran some data on if you printed two-sided or even one-sided color sheets for everything that had to be printed, like your teaching tool or your story props, you absolutely have to print those. And then you printed everything you everything we give you, teaching guide, everything. It comes out to like $30 if you add in the cost of ink and printing, okay? Um, so it's still way less than over $100. But most of that doesn't have to be printed. So if you only print out the absolute bare minimum of what you do need to print, it's well less than that. So we wanted to do it this way because A, we just feel like it's the wave of the future. B, it's good for the environment. And C, it's just more it allowed us to be much more open-ended we we don't have a lot of craft projects in fact the art that we have in there is very if it's called art or if it has the art symbol that means it's open-ended and everybody's is going to look different um, it's not to say there's anything wrong with craft projects they're great for fine motor and following directions but it's just not what we wanted to get into um, so if you scroll down a little further You'll see our, our US map, and this is where you can click to see your state standards chart. And that chart will then have all those learning indicators, those codes that I showed you in the back of the teaching guide in that chart. They'll be on there for your specific state. We do have a blog underneath FCC tools that has a lot of really interesting blog topics. And again, everything you see under all of these tabs, except for the GWE, because I'm logged in, is open to everybody. So providers can download and utilize any of these. And like Sherry said, our seasonal and holiday things will be listed here. We don't really have anything right now because last holiday was 4th of July, but we'll probably have some things coming up in September and definitely in October. Um, we usually do things related to pumpkins and leaves and all all that good stuff, um, some of which can be adapted if they want to do Halloween, but we don't do Halloween per se. Um, and we did that on purpose. We didn't want the curriculum to be tied to specific holidays. We wanted that, again, to be optional for providers that they can pick and choose. Um, so I'm going to go back to the home page because it is now 227 and we're getting close to the one hour mark. I would like to take this time to take questions and, and, and answer any questions anybody has, um, any comments they would like to share. I would love to hear anything that I can, you know, any, anything I can answer or ideas you may have on how we can support providers better. We're always open to different ideas. And yes, if you've attended this, we can do a certificate, a train to trainer certificate that says you attended. Um, and if you're interested in more in depth, training for your staff or if we can support your agency as you support providers we can do lots of things um, we have flyers we can provide to you that talk about the curriculum and even offer your your providers a discount on their first month we can let you know uh, about our next cohort webinar which you can actually find that under our support tab which is right here we'll be posting the link to that um, if we haven't done it already we just set yeah. it up we have not. It was just set up today. <laughs> so it, it will be the link to register for our next cohort webinar will be down here. And we'll change this to say, when will a cohort meet the next time? And we'll put the new link for the August webinar. It will be August the 20th at 7 p.m. in the evening. And again, anybody can join the webinar and join the cohort. It's not just customers. Um, so that said, any questions I can answer at this time?
what Beth is um, referring to also is we can create a flyer that you can um, email to the providers so that um, I'm sure the providers you work with, you probably have a, a list of their email that will give them the link to sign up for like the cohort. And even if they're not a user or customer, they could still sign up for the cohort webinar uh, just to become more familiar. And also as we're doing just general training, just to introduce other providers to the uh, to the curriculum, we can provide you with a flyer that you could share with them. Um, if after, because we're getting real close on that one hour mark, if afterward you have any questions, because I don't have any coming up right now, uh, you can always send a uh, our questions to customer service at gwizeducation.com or either smayberry at gwizeducation.com or bsmith at gwizeducation.com. Um, so please don't hesitate after this is over with if you've got questions then just to uh, let us know. Um, but we don't have any questions, so not to take any more time, um, I guess we're going to uh, end the webinar now. And again, your link will take you to a recording of this webinar, um, so you can share that with uh, other workers or yourself. You can go back and review because we do go very fast. Uh, but thank you so much for attending today. We appreciate your time and attention. And with that, we'll say good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye.